I had a fascinating encounter this week. I had some work done on my tractor, uh, and I was, I was kind of hanging around, you know, spitting and whittling and talking to the mechanic. Uh, it, he asked me what I did, and I said, I'm a pastor. That always brings up some type of interesting response. It usually cleans up the language pretty good. <laughs> but he said, I don't go to church anymore. Not one to let that go. I said, well, if you don't mind, I'd just like to ask you why. And he said, all they, ask, all they talk about is money. And then he said, uh, don't get me wrong, I've got nothing against Jesus, but I just can't believe he came so that me or that preacher could be rich. I thought, fascinating. I wonder what church he had been visiting. It might have been one like this. New from Pastor Brian Houston, money. There's not one person in this building who doesn't need more money. And if you say, well, I don't need more money, then I would say you have a very poor outlook on life. You'll learn why you need more money. Because money is a tool that can accomplish phenomenal things. What money can do in your hand is bless, it can help, it can build, it can increase, it can bring vision, it can strengthen. You'll learn how to get more money. And you'll learn how to have wealth without having a love for money. Poor does not have to be permanent. All the answers here, you say, well, you know, how do you know that? Because why would the scripture say, let the poor say, I am rich? If it wasn't the will of God to break the power of poverty over people's life. In this life-changing tape series, Pastor Brian Houston will challenge you to live according to the principles of God and see his blessing on your life as you become a money magnet. Money! Come up to me now! Money is trying to get into your hands right now even as I speak. God's Almighty, he's trying to change your financial position but you don't think it's a part of God's recovery. We ain't going to do that. We're not going to mess this message up. Amen. Act a fool on it like people have other messages that God has given down through the years. No, sir. We're going to walk on this one right down the middle of the road. And we're going to be word people. And we're going to stay word people. And we're going to be wealthy word people in the things of God. And when you're wealthy in God, you're content all the time. All the time. Somebody said, oh, I didn't come here because I want to hear about money. I came here because I need some peace. Well, honey, you need some money or you ain't going to never know no peace. So tonight, I want to talk to you about the relationship between money and peace. But a lot of hurt people say, it's not about money. It's about peace and it's about joy and it's about love. It's about money. You understand what I'm saying? Y'all better obey the prophet and you will reap the prophet's reward. My prophet is rich and I'm going to be rich too. I call in the money. I found me a picture. This is my first billion and I speak to it. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? I call it in. To recognize what this Bible is saying. God is trying to put glorious material wealth and blessings into our hands and he's going to do it by way of the anointing. I did not come here to preach this message to you to see what I can get out of you. I didn't come here to get anything from you. I'm already wealthy. I'm loaded. I got more than enough. I'm a blessed man. I didn't come here to get something from you. I didn't ride here on Delta. I rode here on my own airplane. You understand what I'm saying? I didn't come here to get nothing from you. I came here to get this message to you. I came here to bring you something that's going to deliver you out of this financial bondage. I came here to get you something that's going to step you out of where you are right now. And you'll never be the same again. It's about money. It's about money. Turn to Colossians chapter 2, please. If you'll recall when we began our study of Colossians, it's fascinating because you are hearing one half of a conversation. Paul has not been to the city of Colossae, and yet probably at the, at the 
request of his friend who had been the pastor there. He is answering questions for the church. He's dealing with issues to, with, with the church to, uh, which he's never visited and people whom he, he, he doesn't know. People they've never had a chance to meet before. Particularly in chapter 2, you're gonna, the issues are going to jump out at you when you see the answers. And here's what's always fascinating to me when I, when I read Paul writing to the churches. The issues over the years haven't changed much. Music's a little different. Dress is a little bit different. But the issues that face us haven't changed very much over the years. I want you to look at when Paul is establishing his credentials, particularly in chapter 2, he says this, I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea, which, by the way, is in the same region, only a few hundred miles away, and for all who have not met me personally. So there we know. Look, most of the people there, likely almost all of them, I haven't met. I'm struggling for you. How could he be? What's he doing right now that means he's struggling? Help me. You know where he is. He's in jail. He's really been struggling. How is he struggling for that church? He's struggling for the word. And, and for them, even though he may have not met them. So he wants, to, he wants to establish a kinship with them. Look, I know what you're suffering. I'm struggling with you right now. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, I'm going to stop right there. One thing that he's leading to the church, he says, look, I, I want you to be encouraged. That's been Paul's message all along. Look, troubles, trials, tribulations, I'm in jail for crying out loud, but I want you to be encouraged because you have a priceless gift. Now, what he's going to do is he's going to now rebut those who are ta- the early Gnostics who are saying, you know, that, that there is power in knowledge and salvation is found through knowledge, particularly those who say, God has revealed a special knowledge to me. Because I go to Wednesday night services. God, I'm a super Christian. God's revealed a special knowledge to me. Look what he says. My purpose is that they may have the full riches of complete understanding. Is he talking to special people here? He's talking to the saints. He's talking to the church, not, not particular individuals. The mystery of, they know the mystery of God. Now, mystery, remember in Scripture, mysterion is not something that's not to be known, but it's something that's hit, heretofore hidden and now revealed by God. So God has revealed this mystery. What's the mystery? Christ. Has Christ been around since time immemorial? Certainly. Christ is God. But he wants, to, he wants us to know God has revealed Christ's purpose in dying, being buried, and being resurrected as payment of our sins. So that mystery has been revealed to us. In whom are hidden, you want to talk about hidden mysteries? There it is right there, Christ Jesus. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So you know what he's saying about these so-called uh, elite Christians? Their knowledge means nothing. Their wisdom means nothing aside from what that which Christ has imparted to us, that, that Christ has given us. Now look what he says. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent with you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. I don't know how much he really believed that last sentence. I don't know how much he understood about the last sentence. But he had to be positive with them, and he said, Look, it seems to me that you have been led astray by some fancy talk and preacher who got in after the gospel was already presented to you. And he's presenting his statement right now so that they will not be led astray and they, that they will cling to the truth. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him. Rooted. Let me stop right there. I don't know that we use that phrase enough, but to the Christian walk, it is an imperative. It's something that must be. Uh, And I don't really think it matters whether you're a baby Christian or whether you've been in the faith for, for 60 or 70 years and you have a strong walk in Christ. If you're not rooted, you're blown away. You know what I'm talking about? So when it talks about grounded, I like the word grounded too. He uses rooted uh, and it gives, the picture is of deep, strong roots that not only encourage you, but also stabilize you. 
That's how Paul saw the gospel. That's why he so fiercely defended it against those who would pervert it, change it, or do away with it. Those were your roots. Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught. Strengthened in the faith how? As you were taught with the gospel. And overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principle of this world rather than on Christ. That's our focal passage for today, so we're going to come back to it a bit later. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. He just, uh, just made really good arguments right there against several heresies that were floating around that day and to tell you the truth float around today in Christ he's talking about fullness okay what else do you need remember when we talked about how to spot a a cult how to spot a, a false religion it's maybe Jesus and Jesus and Jesus and what do we need and nothing so in Christ you have the fullness He's the fullness of the gospel. And and he is, and and it also talks about the deity. So who is he? Remember the question we asked during baptism? Who is he? He's God. He is literally God. And then it says, in bodily form. Why would he throw that in there? Because there are those still floating around, and there are those today who said he was never resurrected. That God didn't come down as man. To actually be man, it was just kind of an apparition. He was a a super person type of thing. Or that when Jesus was resurrected, he wasn't really resurrected in bodily form, but in spirit only. Paul puts that to rest right here. In bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who's the head over every power and authority. So what's he getting settled there? The primacy and supremacy of Christ. There is none before him. He is equal with God. So when you relegate him to a pantheon of gods, or when you make him co-equal with another god, that's a mistake in your your theology, in your gospel. And so he's saying, look, there is none above him. He's above every power and authority. In him you are also circumcised. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is he talking to a Jewish audience here? Or is he even speaking literally? Literally. He's he's speaking about spirit. He certainly is. Who is he answering now? The Judaizers who are saying to the believers who, who had been Gentiles, look, you're not really a believer until you become circumcised, become Jewish, and then you can become a Christian. Paul fought that literally from the first day he left the first village he visited. That, that heresy cropped up immediately. So now he's addressing it. He's saying, in him you were circumcised in putting off the sinful nature. So repentance was required before salvation. And look what he said. Not with circumcision done by the hands of men. I'm not talking about what, what the Jews are trying to get you done. But I love this picture. But the circumcision done by Christ. Really? Really? Well, yes, we're talking about a covenant, and it's, as he mentions earlier in, in some other Pauline letters, the circumcision of the heart. He mentions that a couple of other times. So he says, okay, if you say you need to be circumcised, that's fine, but here's the circumcision. It's the circumcision that Christ brings to your heart. Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins, let me stop right there. This is about the fourth time that he's used this in the last three weeks. It's an example that I hope we never forget or misplace. And it, he, he, the examples, the opposed examples that he gives are death and life, darkness and light. You lived in darkness, now you live in the light. You were dead. Uh, and what he's talking about is, is exactly what I talked about in the sermon that I did a few weeks ago. Dead man walking. And I don't know if you ever got that picture that before you came to have a relationship with Christ, you were in fact dead. You might have been walking around. You might have been partying with your neighbors. You might have been going on about life as you know it. But you were dead in what? In your sins. Because you hadn't accounted for them. 
When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, he's already talked about Jesus circumcising, circumcising our hearts. So now he says the uncircumcision was your sinful nature. God made you alive with Christ. God picked you out, chose you to save you, and he made you alive through what vehicle? Through what person? Through Christ. Having, okay, made you alive with Christ, he forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. So right now he's throwing up another hand to the legalists, to the Judaizers, who said, you know, you have to observe these festivals, you have to observe these dietary laws, you still can't eat meat sacrificed to idols. What did Paul say about that? He forgave our sins and canceled the written code with its reg regulations. Now, what he's not preaching is he's not preaching complete license, but he is saying your salvation does not depend on, your, on, on the impossible task of adhering to the law. I lost my place. There we are. That law was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. That's a beautiful picture to me. I, I got to tell you one Sunday evening I will never forget. Many years ago the pastor was, was talking about the beauty of forgiven sin. And we had the, the little cross that I think every church in the world has that we use for Easter pageants and such as that and your dramas. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we brought it out from the storage room and he laid it right down here on the, on the front altar. And at the end he says the amazing thing is is that when you confess your sins to God, He is free. He is quick to forgive them. And I, tonight, if you have something you want to ask Him to forgive, I want you to come down here. There were sheets of paper, uh, or you could use things in the pew. Write it down, and there were nails, roofing nails, Barry, so it wouldn't hammer their fingers quite so bad, uh, and just nail that to the cross. And it was incredible to see people flock down to the front, and when they were done, a cross covered with scraps of paper. It did, Never occurred to me to look at it like that, but those were the sins that were nailed to the cross. A beautiful example that he gives here. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, right now he's not talking about earthly powers, although that could certainly be uh, implied in here, but right now he's talking about the power of Satan, the power of sin, and the power of death. Having disarmed them, you know, when... Death died when Christ was, was crucified and resurrected. So he disarmed that. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. He wanted them never to forget in the church the, the picture of the cross, because that's where the debt was paid. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink. So you know the, the problem that had cropped up there? Apparently, they were still those who were adhering to the Mosaic law and saying, okay, we can't eat this, we can't eat that, we can't do this on this day, we can't walk this far. And Paul's addressing that right now, saying, did you not know you were free from that? And as, as he said earlier in our study, having been freed from it, why do you insist to go back to your shackles? It's amazing that being freed, people would desire to go back to slavery. Because they knew nothing else. Because some people were teaching falsely that that was the vehicle to salvation. So that's, that's why people went back willingly to it. They thought somehow Jesus wasn't enough. It had to be Jesus and circumcision. Jesus and the law. Don't let anyone judge you with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Ooh, now that's kind of interesting. That means the Ten Commandments are null and void? Doesn't mean it at all. Are we still to observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy? Yes, we are. Do it, does our salvation depend on it? No, it does not. But there were those who were saying that it was, and in the observance of a new moon festival or the festival of booths or in what you ate or drank, and he said, you're looking for love in all the wrong places. That's just not the place. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. That's fascinating to me when I see that because he's saying, look, God gave us that. He gave us that and it was good, but the law was to convict us, convict us of sin. It, adherence to the law would, was never intended to save us. 
That was a shadow of the mystery that was going to be revealed in Christ Jesus when he came. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you from the prize. He's addressing two different heresies right now. One is the worship of angels. I talked to you last week about they had a complete hierarchy of angels that they worshipped. Um, listen, angels have, have a place. Angels are created beings, though. They are, they are not uh, to be worshipped. And they themselves make it clear. Remember when, when John, in writing Revelation, said that uh, he saw the angel. He wanted to fall down and worship him. The angel says, whoa, no, let's don't be doing that. But people were worshiping angels at this time. Another thing he talks about, false, false humidity. Humidity, that's great. <laughs> would that be wet or dry? But false humility, who had adapted an, an asceticism, which says, the more that I suffer for Christ, uh, the more, the more I'm, I'm saved, or the more religious I am. Don't get me wrong, there will be suffering in following Christ. But those who wear it as a badge were almost like the Pharisees whose phylacteries on their forehead got so big they, their, their necks were sore or their tassels that swept the streets as they walked because the bigger the tassel, the more devout. And, and he calls it false humility here. Such a person goes into great detail about what he's seen and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. So he's talking about those who claim to be super believers and in their lack of humility, in their puffed up mind, okay, uh, he becomes unspiritual. He's lost connection with the head. Now this is kind of interesting. Who do you think he's talking about now? From whom the whole body is supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. Well, who's the head of the church? Christ is. Tells us in many different places. He, one who's puffed up with his own knowledge, has lost his connection with Christ. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? That's a good question. And one of the study questions that I sent you in my little weekly email was this. What, what habits... Uh, ceremonies or rules do we still cling to and if you think we don't you're kidding yourself and if you don't look out the stuff that you do that's attendant with your worship service can become the object of your worship are you, you here with me that's why, as Baptists, who are people of uh, only the Scripture, sola scriptura, believe that there are two ordinances. Okay, we don't refer to them as sacraments. We refer to them as ordinances, and we say that there are only two. Why? Because Jesus commanded that we do them. And there are only two. What are they? Okay, baptism and the Lord's Supper. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Do. Baptism, he commanded us. So, don't make the mistake of worshiping those things, but also all the other accoutrements that, that somehow get a, attached to religion. And let me tell you, I'm going to go completely from the sublime to the ridiculous here. Uh, I've been in a place before that worshipped its order of worship. You been there? You been to that church? Where if you dare move the offering to the front of the service, somebody is upset. Because we worship, we can worship a building, we can, we can worship uh, the, the way that we worship, the order in which we worship, the songs that we sing, um, uh, the way that we do the Lord's Supper. I one, one time participated in a very meaningful service wherein we gathered together in family units and, and uh, it, wasn't a, it was a Passover type celebration, it wasn't a Seder meal. But we actually observed the Lord's Supper at the table, and someone was very upset because we were all picking off the same loaf. Ah. You know, actually, that was closer to the original than what we'd been, but she liked those little wafers. And I think if we don't look out, we can completely misappropriate our worship. Why do you submit to the rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with youth, 
use because they are based on human commands and teachings. One thing I love is that uh, when uh, Peter and, and James were called before the Sanhedrin uh, and they were commanded to quit, to quit preaching, if you'll recall that, and uh, when one of the great rabbis stood up, Gamaliel, uh, and said, you know what, let's be real careful here because if this is, not, if this is of man, it's going to go away. And if it's of God, what are you going to do to stop it? Brilliant. That's what Paul's saying here about these teachings of men. They're going to go away. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. So look what he's saying. All these things are things men dreamed up in order to to be more spiritual, hoping that it drew them closer to God, when in fact all you need to do to be drawn closer to God is Jesus. That's all you have to have. Why then are we so drawn to that? We were in the first century and we are today. Why are we drawn to that? We really want to feel that we have a hand in it. That there's something we do, and it just frustrates some people to death to think, you know what, you've heard me say this before, what did I bring to my salvation? Just my sin. That was it. There's nothing I can do to gain it. Surely, having gained it, I will then observe the, and, and, and exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, but none of this stuff that I do is any good toward gaining my salvation. Uh, I read a, um, excuse me, I, I got a YouTube video that I, I shared with Karen uh, about uh, Tim Keller uh, talking about how to deal with postmodern people and postmodern thought, uh, and it was brilliant, and, and one of the things he talked about is the reluctance of people uh, to admit that Jesus is their Lord and to have that kind of relationship with him because as one woman said, if I do that, then he can ask something of me. If my salvation is found in this stuff, in circumcision, or in rituals, or in festivals, or in things that I can control, then I can keep him at arm's length because I can control it. But if my salvation is dependent 100% on him, he's got a right to ask stuff of me. And we're not ready to give that. Turn back to verse uh, 8, if you will. This is the one that the Holy Spirit just highlighted for me. And I know that some of you are going to say, why do you keep harping on this? Uh, and I'm going to tell you it's for the same reason that Paul kept harping on false teachers, because they will not go away. And so it's incumbent on us, those of us who preach the gospel, to also preach against those who would adulterate the gospel. So I want you to look at what he said. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophies which depend on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. I don't know about you, but when I saw the clip of Creflo Dollar's, interesting name for a, a prosperity preacher, Creflo Dollar, uh, at, at his church, it was bad enough to see his histrionics up on the stage or the woman who had a picture of her first million dollars that she was going to, God was going to give her. That was bad enough, but did you see the congregation? They were all over it. They were eating it up. It's the largest growing segment of, and I'm going to use quotes here, Christianity in the world today is the prosperity gospel. And you are probably looking there at, how does it happen? You're not in one of those churches, so apparently you're not buying it. But you've got to ask, how does it happen? I'm going to give you three things. You can write them down, remember them, whatever you want. But I'm going to give you three things that can make this happen. One is that you take a kernel of truth supported by authority. In this case, you saw both of the pastors in question quote Scripture completely out of context, completely incorrectly. But they took a kernel of truth, it was Scripture, 
And it's backed by the weight and authority of God's Word. The second thing is that you distort it or misuse it with conviction. And generally you get some silver-tongued preacher who's good at, at using his words and forceful and, 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 and attractive in his presentation and, and get him to distort it or misuse it, but he'll do it with conviction. I mean, did you see when Kenneth Copeland said, Money! Then the next thing that you have to do is appeal to the listener's needs and or wants. All right? Now, I really believe that built into the soul of every man is the need to connect with the Almighty. You've seen it throughout history, regardless of what religion it is. You've, you've seen it forever. Man, wants to, man tends to be spiritual. So you can take their desire to be spiritual... And then you can use that to pollute them and combine it with the greatest motivator in human history, greed. It's, it's like in, in the days of when Paul was preaching in, in, in several of these uh, cities that he went to, and one of the things he combated, believe it or not, was temple prostitution. I don't know about you, but I used to just shake my head. You mean... I, I, I get, got it. You know, what if you're a guy in the first century? You say, well, how can I be spiritual? Well, go convert with a prostitute. I can be spiritual. Well, that combines your, your basest nature with the spiritual need, and you're feeling pretty good that you've done your church for the day. You've got to be kidding me. Same thing with this prosperity gospel. People are greedy. And if you get someone who can take a kernel of truth, Jesus did come that we would have life more abundantly. He did say that. It's backed up by Scripture. Does life more abundant mean a Cadillac? No. You know that. But you know what? When your greed starts taking over, you can convince yourself that that's what it means. Let me give you an example. I saw an interesting study the other day. I read about it on WebMD that, that talked about a, a very large study. As a matter of fact, it had a pretty good sample group that said that chocolate is actually pretty good for your heart. Can I get an amen? amen? There you go. Chocolate is actually pretty good for your heart. So if I were wired this way, why don't I do this? I'll take that little kernel of truth, uh, and I would go to noted cardiologist Lindley Watson, for example, and I would say, Doc, have you read this study? And Doc would say, yes, I have. And then I would get... Dr. Watson in his lab coat and stethoscope around his neck to say, you know, eating chocolate can have some benefits. And then I'd go make myself a commercial. And, and I would say, okay, I want you to, to view the miracle of Crestview chocolate. Processed from purest cocoa beans in the, Am in, in, not the Amazon, in Nicaragua to make the most beautiful dark chocolate. And if you eat it, not only... Will your heart be healthier, but you will lose weight eating all the chocolate you want to eat. And I guarantee you I could go on daytime TV and sell a truckload of chocolate. Why? Because I've taken a kernel of truth. Chocolate can be good for you in small amounts and for your heart. Support it with a trusted source, Dr. Lindley Watson. I saw him on TV say that chocolate was good for you. Then, then I'd twist it and say, well, it also makes you lose weight. Where does that say that anywhere? You can throw a lie in there, and I would do it with conviction. And I guarantee you they would be like lemmings falling off the cliff, following me to get that chocolate. And so that's why Paul found it necessary, so sadly, though, to say, see to it that no one takes you captive. It's incumbent. I believe that you are discerning individuals. You are not sheeple. You are not uh, lemmings. Uh, I have to believe that because you haven't fallen prey uh, to the Joel Osteens of the world, to the Kenneth Copelands of the world, to the Creflo Dollars of the world. Uh, because what they're preaching is heresy. Do you not see that? It's heresy. And yet someone will always come back to me and say, ah, why are you on Joel Osteen again? I heard him say, he just has a very positive message. Listen, listen, be discerning. 
And, and part of what he said is true. That's right. Because if he just jumped right out with a big lie, you wouldn't buy it. You have to have a kernel of truth and somehow support it with something that you trust. And that's how people who are even Christians find themselves, look, if I can worship and, and praise my God and, and, and He can make me rich while I'm doing it, sounds okay to me. Paul fought that. It's not new. And so that's why I urge you and, and everyone who, who enters the doors here to be discerning. Do not follow hollow and deceptive philosophy that depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. And I got to tell you, if from the pulpit at Crestview Baptist Church, if we stop preaching Christ and Him crucified, get out. Get out. Because you're in the wrong place. He's not letting up yet. Next week, chapter 3. Uh, I don't know if you notice your little notes in your, if you have the NIV. Uh, there's the very first thing is, uh, the very first word is something my wife just hates. And I, I assume most of us do too. Rules. <laughs> rules for holy living. Read that forward. You might be interested to see what he mentions. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day. And I thank you for the gospel. For your free gift of salvation even though we did nothing to merit it. Father, I want to pray for those pastors that preach a message other than what you've given us, than the true gospel, and pray that you would move in their hearts with the influence they have, Father, think of the good they could do for the kingdom if you just shone the light upon them. Father, I want to pray for Crestview that we would continue to be discerning people, that we would never fall to hollow and deceptive philosophies. And I want to pray, Father, that as we leave this place, we leave so with a special boldness determined to share the gospel with others. Now bless us as we go, for we are indeed people sharing Jesus, and we do it in your name. Amen. Please find someone you don't know and say hello to them.